Welcome to One Plus One, I'm Stan Grant. Alex McKinnon grew up thinking that he knew what it was to be a man. He looked at his father and he saw strength. He saw independence. He achieved everything he wanted as a professional footballer. And then in one moment, he lost it all. Alex McKinnon had to learn what it was to reinvent himself. He sat down with me for this discussion about identity. Alex McKinnon, welcome to One Plus One. Yeah, thank you for having me. Who is Alex McKinnon? It's a great question. <laughs> um, I'm definitely a passionate, caring person. I uh, feel like I'm very respectful and um, I'm definitely a lover. Um, <laughs> love to interact with people and to feel that connection with people. Uh, yeah. If I'd have asked you that, you know, when you were 15, 16, or 18, 19, you were coming into playing football. If I'd have said, who are you, was the first thing you would have said then, I'm a footballer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and because that was, that was absolutely your world, wasn't it? From such a young age, in your family, football was just deeply embedded. Yeah, definitely. And I loved it. And I still do love it. Mm. But I didn't see anything else. That's all I could see, um, and I wasn't scared of that. I, I enjoyed it. I, um, I feel like when you want to achieve something in life, you have to set your eyes on the task and go and get it. And um, a lot of people these days, or even back then, kind of shared away from or shied away from setting a goal and really going for it. And that wasn't me. I, I wanted to play NRL. I wanted to be the best that I could. And you were a big diary keeper. Weren't you? mm. You'd write down your goals, you'd write down the things you wanted yeah. to achieve, and you did that all the time. I want to achieve this, I want to achieve this by this yeah. age. And you set, you set your mind on that. Yeah, and I, I feel like I'm a really big observer. I, I love to watch and, and listen. I think because I'm an only child, I've grown up in that space. I, I grew up around a rugby league club and my dad was really influential in the local community so I was always felt like he was the leader and I kind of sat behind him as a young kid and he always took me everywhere he went so I was always watching and listening and taking in all the good and bad things and kind of filtering them out and seeing what I could use for myself but I, I feel like I haven't let that go and um, being able to um, write and diary things for me is really important and even to this day it, it's really important for me to diary because it clears my thoughts and I feel like when I'm having a good run of emotions and um, productive days, it's when I am journaling. I'm glad you mentioned your dad because, you know, reading about you and, and reading your book, which I have here in my hand, your dad was just so central. He was a football player, but he took all the lessons of life, what it took to be a man, mm. you got from your dad, didn't you? Yeah. I think I also got it from him but how people perceived him mm. um, wasn't necessarily that he sat me down and said, this is how you do things or um, this is what you need to do in this situation. It was more that he led with it by example and yeah, very lucky to have a dad like I did. I, I, when I was a boy and I grew up in similar sort of circumstances in a way to you, you know, you grow up in small country towns and you know, it's a working class family and a working class culture and a very masculine culture. Dad was a footballer and, and a boxer and how I grew up seeing what it was to be a man was to be physical. Um, in that world, he was a sawmiller, he was a footballer, he was a boxer. The world that he was preparing me for was that world. Very, very rigid boundaries, tough, tough lessons. Yeah. But it was very much this sense that to be a man was to be 
strong in the world for yourself and for your family. Is that what you saw with your dad? Yeah, definitely. I think as well, um, strong in your opinions. I think um, unquestioned, I think is something which I used to see as how men should be perceived and um, a definite presence, unquestionable strength is what how I used to see um, a, a man um, within that community and it's definitely not how it should be, um, mm. but that's how I would perceive it as having a real strength, a real dominance, um, unquestioned. Mm. Um, I wouldn't say feared, but um, definitely um, a strong presence. I learned a lot about people from my dad. and um, Yeah, I also learned a lot from my dad um, watching him go through, I suppose, the transition of me being injured and not having football is such a forefront in my life and seeing how he handled that and um, how he handled seeing his child be injured and, um, and the loss of certain things that he could had lived in his life that um, I or he thought that I wasn't going to be able to do. How did he handle it? It was tough to see. Was it? Yeah, yeah. really tough. Um, really tough to see. Just I felt like I could just see this anger, yeah. Um, I felt like a dad always wants to protect their child and not see them injured and give them everything in life and give them the opportunity to go and do things that they want. And um, at my age, I think he thought that um, I was coming into an era where I had worked so hard to achieve a lot of things in rugby league and set myself up and he felt that my life was just about to be lived with children and um, to be able to explore different things in life. And I, I felt that he, he thought that it was all over. Mm -hmm. um, but that's where I suppose we are different because I didn't see it like that. Yeah. Can I take you back to that, to that game against Melbourne? Um, and look, if, if you don't want to go yeah. there, I absolutely understand no, right. because in the book, when I was reading about that tackle mm. and that night, it was like you could recall every mm. single moment yeah. where the opposing players were, how you felt, the position yeah. you got yourself in. Can you go back there to that moment for us? Yeah, I definitely can. I know what it felt like. I remember hearing the noise. I remember trying to move but not being able to. Um, I remember players surrounding me, looking at me. Uh, I remember clear conversations. I could hear everything um, and who was around me. Um, it sounds really weird, but when you are injured like that, you can't feel anything. But I really recall how cold it was, how silent it was on the night. Um, yeah, I just really felt embarrassed, to be honest. Embarrassed? Yeah, I, I, I suppose it takes you back to being a man and what, what your identity is there. and um, Strong, unfathomable, um, unwavering. I just felt that it was embarrassing that I was laying there unable to move and I just felt like a real failure, yeah. Did you know then, Alex, when everything went cold, and quiet, how bad this was? Yeah, I knew, I knew straight away. Yeah, straight away. It's why when I went into the sheds that I asked for my phone to call my mum and my partner Tegan, because I just, I knew it was very serious. I remember Paul Harrigan standing in the sheds next to me, touching my legs, touching my hands. Um, can you just, feel? Can no, you that's what he was saying. You know, I couldn't feel anything, so, um, yeah. And then you went to hospital and the doctors do the examination, they look at you and what, what do they say? Yes, yeah, so I was unconscious straight away for about three to five days. And mm. my first real recollection was somebody standing over me with a, with a pin uh, doing uh, an assessment on my body. And that was to kind of classify my injury. Um, obviously it was a spinal cord injury, but um, they try and assess feeling and reaction and temperature. And I felt at that point when I was laying there that I wasn't 
a human, I was more of an object. And it's something which I'd really struggled with uh, post being injured, um, not attaching yourself to, to me, you know what I mean? And mm. I felt like a real object and I was not a human, which sounds really weird, but um, when people start to treat your injury and the effect that an injury like that can have on your life and how it consumes you, um, you start to identify yourself with that injury and not myself, Alex McKinnon. So on that night, that was a really clear reflection and image that I can still see to this day of a, a female standing over me, pricking my body, trying to assess me, um, not talking to me. It was yeah, a really, really weird feeling. There's a part of the book that um, when, when I read it, I just, um, I had to, uh, I had to put it down, you know, I had to put it down several times. Um, I'm going to ask you to read it, mm. if, if you wouldn't mind, um, and then I'll ask you about that person in that, in that night. Can I get you to read from alone just down to the past? Yeah, can you just put it here on my lap, that's okay. Perfect. Just from yep. there down to there. It's the first time I've read this. Yeah. Alone in my ward, the pent-up anger and frustration had taken over my emotions and I wasn't willing to fight any longer. Uh, I began to yell and sob as tears streamed down my face. My parents were outside and down the hall, rushed to my bedside, finding their hysteric 22-year-old son in a state of despair. I'm fucking over this. I don't want to be here. I screamed. This is making me sick to my stomach. Why can't I just die? Why can't you just kill me? Why are you going to put me through this? How can you let me live like this? Is it just for yourself? I'm happy to die. I want this over. Why, why, why? Yeah. To be honest, it's probably something that I've forgotten about. Mm. Yeah. It's hard. When you, when you asked me to read that, I didn't know what you were asking me to read, to be honest. And that's honestly how I felt on the, on the weeks after I was injured. I felt like I was alive just for them. And um, I had no idea what my life was going to be like um, post my injury. Thanks. Thanks for reading it, Alex. It's, um, to be honest with you, when I, when I read that and, uh, and, I, and I, I, I try to put myself in that, mm. in that position, it's, you know, I speak like that's probably why we, why we read stories and mm. we, we want to know what it's like. Um, and I've, I've asked myself this a lot. I've, I've really struggled with this. What would I do? You know, would I have the strength? Mm to want to go on? Could I go on? What, what would I be? What, what would I be as a, as a person, as a man? I mean, you said you didn't feel like you were human mm. anymore. I really don't know. Yeah. I really don't know, Alex, how I would. How did you? It took a lot of time. Um... It's a hard one to answer, to be completely honest. I don't know how I am in the position that I am today. Um, mentally, uh, I'm a big believer that sometimes you just need to ride the wave. You just need to trust that over time, that things will not be what they will be because you need to be productive and you need to attack it. But time is a beautiful thing. It can, you just sometimes need to give something time. And at that time in my life, I didn't want to go on. I felt that my parents were being really selfish, um, that my injury was really serious and I didn't want to live a life in a wheelchair. And that's what my mind was fixated on. I, I couldn't see what my life would be like. Yeah. 
And it comes back to that thing, isn't it? You talked about your dad and you're watching your dad and your dad struggling. You know, this guy who had all the answers. Mm. You know, the guy that you look to, this is what a man is. Yeah. And then you fulfilled all of that. You're, you're that man. Mm. Do you have to then start saying to yourself, what is a man now? Yeah. Who is Alex McKinnon now? Yeah. When all that's taken away from you? What was the answer to that? Um, I don't know the answer. I, I feel like I'd never seen a man reinvent themselves. I'd never seen a man be vulnerable. Uh, yeah, so I, that's what I was scared of, having to reinvent myself, having to start again, having to try new things. Uh, I felt like I'd worked so hard, mm. just so hard to put myself in the position that I had and in a position that I never felt like I'd ever be in. I never felt like I'd play first grade. As much as I wanted that, mm. I never felt like I would do it. Um, I never felt that I would have the contract that I had. Uh, even signing it, I was just going, what? I can't believe I've got this. Or the money. <laughs> my beautiful partner. Yeah. I never felt that I would ever be worthy of having someone like her. Um, a home that I'd bought. Um, sounds really weird, but a lawn to mow. I never felt like I would have those things. I don't know why I felt like that. But on that night when everything was taken away, I just felt ripped off. <laughs> I... I felt really comfortable with where I was in my life and um, having things that I never felt like I would ever have. And I was so scared that all of those things were no longer going to be there and I was going to have to start again. Um, yeah. One of those things um, was not only there, but is still there, and that's, that's Tegan. Mm. You said before, when you got into the shed, you called your mum mm. and you called Tegan. Tell us about Tegan. She's an incredible girl, a woman. She's a real credit to her family as well. I see a lot of her um, family in her and um, she just goes and does things and doesn't think and she just goes and gets things done. She doesn't get overawed by certain things and. Um, yeah, she's been life-changing for me. Did you ever wonder there and then that night, well, you know you were going to be tested, you know it's going to test the relationship. Mm. Did you think at that point that it would survive? I knew it wouldn't break her. I thought it would break me. Mm. Um, I'm somebody that loves to see joy in people. I'm a giver. That's just who I am. I love to provide and give people things and see joy. I remember saying to myself, I'd, I want to work so hard to give Tegan a beautiful home, to give Tegan a family. I, I like to be able to give things to her and give her the life that she deserves. And I remember feeling on that night that she wouldn't leave me um, or she wouldn't get sick of me. I felt that I would get sick of her not being able to do what we used to be able to do. So that's what I was scared of on that night. How do you go from that moment where you're wondering whether you would break um, and you don't want to live to being able to ask Tegan to marry you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Things move fast. Um, thoughts in my head move fast. Um, I remember laying there and talking to Tegan about um, us, the situation that we're in, um, that I was scared, uh, that I loved her. Um, and that I'd planned on asking her to marry me. I wasn't saying it like, this is what I've got planned. Um, so let's do it now. I was more saying, look, this is everything that's been taken away. Like, I can't do this, I can't do that. I love you. And this is what I was going to do. 
um, in a sense. And then she kind of says, that doesn't change anything. Like, we're still the same people. We still love each other. Let's, let's just do it. <laughs> so for me, at that point, I kind of went, oh, OK, yeah. <laughs> She took she took you up. Yeah, she took me up on it, and yeah, it's a, strange to reflect back on those things. But I, um, I suppose one of the big motivations in my life is to be able to provide for her and and be me. And I think that's one of the biggest things that in a relationship you can't lose yourself. And the hard thing for me was going through this injury. I didn't know who I was. I really lost myself. Um, lost my, my identity to rugby league because that's who I was. Um, but the beauty is that she's been with me through the whole thing and allowed me to find myself again. Allowed me to really sit in some dark spots and really self-examine myself. Um, you ask me who I am, to some people that can be a really violating question, mm. exposing, mm. feeling vulnerable. like you're vulnerable, um, naked standing in front of a mirror. Uh, people sometimes don't like to look at themselves. Um, but for me, that's where I had to sit. And I sat in that, in that spot sometimes for months, really scared, really dark, um, really frustrated. Um, but I knew it was a space that I had to sit in to kind of find myself. And we're talking about Tegan here and, and the journey that we've been on. She's supported me through that whole thing. Um, not through advice, not through something that she said, but just her actions. Um, sometimes she didn't expect much from me. Um, and sometimes I think I've been absent in our relationship because I've had to be selfish. Um, but essentially it allowed me to find me and. Um, that's what I bring to our relationship now. Funny, you know, this word love that we throw around and you use it mm. so, so easily. Um, love must f mean very different things to you now. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm very lucky, mate. Yeah, very, very, lucky. very lucky. And I, I don't think I would say, I didn't think I would say that. Um, but some of the positions that me and Tegan have been in, some of the things that she's had to do for me, um, yeah, there's no other reason to do it than that you love somebody. And I'm very lucky that yeah, I have her. Mm -hmm. You're still in the darkness sometimes? Is it, does it go away? You're still there sometimes looking at that self, going into yourself, asking? those questions? I feel like now I don't, I'm not in that space for a long period. I'm, I'm, uh, initially I used to sit in um, a very depressed, negative space, um, searching for answers or ways or myself for an extended period of time, days, weeks. Um, but now I don't really at all, to be honest. I feel really comfortable with who I am. Um, I really respect my injury. You know what I mean? I respect my health. And it's probably something before that I never did. It's an interesting thing to say. Respect the injury? Mm. What, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Uh, I suppose where I spoke before around that person examining me and everything that essentially this injury has done to my life. I hated it. Um, I showed it no respect. I didn't research it. I didn't learn how to live with it. I didn't want to talk to other people in the situations because I was scared of what they would say about living with this. I wanted to do it myself. I wanted to not be conformed by other people's experience of living with a spinal cord injury. I wanted to learn my own way and that's the hard way. Yeah. And to be honest, it, it means that I've made mistakes. For those that don't know, that the spinal cord injury is a very, it's a very rare injury. There's mm -hmm. not many that happen or occur in, in Australia or in the world yearly. 
Um, they're very different. So um, trial and error is really important and having confidence to find the right resources and the right specialist to trust. And um, I feel like sometimes when I get in that negative space that I don't respect the injury, it can make you pay. Um, sometimes that's weeks or months laying in bed. Sometimes that's um, gaining weight or losing weight. Sometimes um, it really affects your mental mindset um, and cannot allow you to live a life. And something which I say to myself all the time, you need to respect the injury, otherwise it can, it can control you, yeah. You said before you'd never seen a man reinvent himself and you have reinvented yourself. Mm. If you look at the reinvention of Alex McKinnon today, husband, father, you're still involved with the Newcastle Knights, you're still working in rugby league. Mm. It's an incredible reinvention, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. That's what I'm more proud about. It sounds really strange that it's not an objective or it's not something that you can see, but I definitely feel that I am who I'm meant to be. I, I feel the emotion. I feel uh, that I'm not trapped. Um, I cry about my daughter getting older. <laughs> you know what I mean, I cry about um, being so grateful. I feel like I'm really in tune with my emotions and I like that because that's who I feel like I'm meant to be. And I believe that before, um, when I was playing football, I was only young, I was only 22 years old, so I had a lot to learn, but I felt like I was really trapped, um, anxious, didn't want to fail. But now I don't, I don't approach life in that way. I'm not scared to make mistakes, I'm, I want to learn. I approach things with a lot of respect. Um, and I'm really in tune with who I am. Um, and I encourage people to do that. You know, I mean, I'd, yeah, I'm a very passionate person and um, I really only want good for people and just very clear with those values and that's me. And that's why I believe that what happened to me was meant to happen. Um, and it sounds crazy, but if, you could say to me, would you take things back and go back to where you were? I, I really wouldn't. Mm. I just wouldn't. I'm, I'm very lucky with the position that I'm in and how I feel about myself and my life. And, but I'm so grateful with, with what I have in my life and I'm going to do everything that I can to make the most of it. Yeah. Um, I think that starts with me. Well, as someone who likes, um, who likes giving, you've, um, you've given us a lot, Alex. Thank yeah. you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. No. Talk to you on OnePlus One, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.